Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you are having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today, we're going to be talking about the horrific events that took the life of Arthur Labino Hughes at only six years old by the hands of his father's girlfriend. Although the father was not there, he and the girlfriend were texting. The father sent a text that said, end him. Let's talk about Arthur Hughes. This story is the crimiest story of them all. It is horrific, so if you don't like child cases, please click out of this video. Arthur was born to his parents, Thomas Hughes and Olivia Labino Hallcrow. They lived in Sully Hill, which is a town in the West Midlands just outside of Birmingham in the UK. I needed help with that one, so thanks Heather for the help. He was a six-year-old at the time of his sudden death. His birthday is January 4th, 2014. Arthur did not have an easy life. Arthur loved his friends, he loved school, he liked to read, and his favorite book was The Gruffalo. Firstly, Arthur was the happiest child. He was very, very much loved by everyone, and he was my sunny delight. He was always happy, and that's why I called him Sunny Delight. Arthur was in the custody of his father, Thomas Hughes, due to his mother, Olivia, being in prison for stabbing her boyfriend. Olivia and Thomas, the dad, were married, but got divorced when Arthur was just about two years old. Olivia struggled with alcohol and drug abuse. Arthur, over his short life, had witnessed numerous scenes of domestic violence by the hands of his parents. Arthur was also present in the home when his mom, Olivia, stabbed her boyfriend to death. Olivia, the mom, had been seeing Thomas Hughes and her off-and-on boyfriend, Mr. Cunningham, at the same time. Apparently, Thomas, Arthur's dad, and her were having a sexual relationship up to the point that Olivia had killed her boyfriend. There was one occasion that Thomas and Olivia fought about her sleeping with Mr. Cunningham and ended up physically wrestling over Arthur as Thomas, the father, took him away to his parents' house. The mom, Olivia, was originally convicted of manslaughter for killing her boyfriend on the grounds of diminished responsibility, and she was jailed for 18 years. She had stabbed her boyfriend 11 times with a kitchen knife, therefore taken his life. But in August of 2020, the conviction was overturned. The Court of Appeal, after judges ruled she may have been acting in self-defense. But following a retrial at Birmingham Crown Court, jurors once again found her guilty of manslaughter in July of 2021, and this time she was sentenced to 11 years. The court heard that Olivia and Mr. Cunningham were on and off, again, boyfriend-girlfriend. At her original trial, she claimed that she was a victim of SA at the hands of Cunningham, but that is just one side of the story. Who knows what actually happened? But Judge Simon Drew, QC, dismissed those allegations and described her as someone who could be a bully and could be a very manipulative person and prone to lies. After his mother's arrest, Arthur went to go live with his dad, Thomas Hughes. His dad and Arthur moved into an annex at the back of their parents' garden. This was around February 2019. Arthur's grandmother, who they lived with, said Arthur was a nervous child at first, but then he warmed up and he seemed to be happy and well-rounded with the change in homes. Thomas, 29 years old, due to Olivia going to prison, Thomas got custody of Arthur. The grandmother wanted Arthur, but Thomas did not want to give up custody. There must have been some kind of incentive to the father because it really didn't seem as though Thomas really 
particularly wanted to have Arthur. In August of 2019, Thomas was on a dating site called Plenty of Fish with a girl named Emma, and she caught his attention. Thomas asked her out, and they went on their first date in a pub, or as we call it, a bar. After three dates, Arthur was introduced to Emma. Immediately in September, one month after dating Emma, there were definitely red flags. Thomas's brother, Blake, said Arthur's behavior changed quite a lot. He wasn't the same happy-go-lucky kid as he once was. The brother would also say Thomas had become a lot stricter to Arthur after he started dating Emma. Hughes also recalled an incident where he argued with Emma because he bought Arthur a Subway sandwich, which she said was an unnecessary treat. An ice cream sundae maybe is a unnecessary treat, but a sandwich? No. Only dating for a few months. Eileen, a special education coordinator at Arthur's school, said Arthur deteriorated. That month, she said he became more reserved, anxious, and just not the same kid that he used to be. Emma and Thomas met in August and Arthur is showing signs of problems by October. Eileen said that Arthur was becoming fixated with his dad disappearing from his life or being taken away from his dad or his dad killing him. Those are some very concerning statements. It makes a bit of sense because he just had lost his mom due to her going to prison and having abandonment issues. But the comment that dad may kill me, that is really scary. In November of 2019, Arthur was acting out even more. So much so that the grandmother of Arthur and the dad, Thomas, spoke to both the school and a pediatrician. They would say that Arthur was clingy, having nightmares, obsessed with murder. He was anxious. He had boyish behavior and trust issues. All were said to be completely normal for a child with those types of circumstances that he had already gone through. And they recognized this and took the proper steps to try to get Arthur some help. The doctor told Thomas that he should love and cherish his son, care for him, not subject him to change. Keep that in mind. Or treat this behavior as naughtiness. Arthur had been told that his mother had joined the army. And then he was told that she went to jail, but she would be home soon. The poor boy didn't know what to believe. And I'm sure he heard the adults talking and probably already knew what was going on. Kids are smarter than we give them credit for. In that same month, Emma became pregnant with Thomas's baby, but unfortunately had, or fortunately, had a miscarriage. I'm sure Arthur heard all about this and didn't know how to deal with this information. Despite the tragic and devastating state of the son Arthur, Thomas still manages to propose to Emma in December of 2019. Four months of dating, not to mention his son is having the hardest time of his life. I'm going to get married. Two days after Arthur's sixth birthday on January 4, 2020, Thomas went to the doctor to say the school was concerned with his clinginess and obsession with soft toys. But teachers had said this was completely untrue. I'm not sure what to make of this. Was he trying to medicate Arthur? Let me know if that makes sense to you guys. On March 4th, Arthur sobbed at school saying his father had taken away his favorite teddy. The school spoke to Thomas and told him that that was wrong and you shouldn't discipline him in that way. That's a comfort for him. There was a lot of mention to not punish by doctors, by the school, and I don't think that's a typical statement to make. So it gives me the impression that Thomas was stating he was punishing him, but it wasn't working or something because it's, it's not common that someone says, hey, don't punish your kid. So I'm not sure why there's so much mention about that. So now you know how Arthur is doing with all the changes. His dad is getting a new fiance. So let's talk about her. Emma Tustin. She was a 32-year-old. She had two children that lived with her, 
but apparently she had four children total, but only had custody of two. An ex-boyfriend of Emma stated that she didn't have a maternal bone in her body, that she had kids for the attention it bring only. The two kids that didn't live with her lived with their father. She lost custody after an attempt on her own life in 2013. The children in the home were four and five years old. The lockdown happened in March of 2020. So leaving the house and limiting who you are around was very strict. Arthur's school was canceled. So Thomas decides to move himself and Arthur into Emma's house. Even though they said to limit any changes in Arthur's life, his dad Thomas thought a big change to move in with his girlfriend fiance was a good idea. You don't have to look too far into this case to get the picture that Thomas valued his relationship with Emma far more than he did with his son. He would also admit that as well later. He would admit that later. Emma and Arthur were forced to be together. Emma and Arthur were not getting along. Over the months, Emma would tell Thomas that she couldn't deal with Arthur's behavior and that he needed to move back or both of them needed to move back to the grandparents' house because she couldn't deal with it. She said that during lockdown, Thomas spent all of his time in bed or playing computer games, or he would take these long shopping trips, leaving her to deal with all the kids. That's pretty much what everybody did during lockdown, isn't it? <laughs> except the long shopping trips. Everything was closed, so the grocery store was really the only place you could go, but anyway, she felt like she was the only one taking care of the kids, and she was not happy about it. Thomas didn't want to leave Emma, so he just started to punish Arthur even more. When he didn't get the results he wanted, he went a little bit further, and when that didn't work, he went a little bit further, which turned into torture. There were texts that were shown where Emma would regularly ask Thomas, please come back. Help me. I cannot cope. I'm crying. I'm broken. Please take him to his nans. She was saying again and again, what do you want me to do with him? So Early on, there was some friction between Emma and Arthur, but Thomas chose Emma. By January 2021, Thomas's parenting was being questioned. On New Year's Eve, Thomas had a huge argument with his father, and they were screaming at one another because Thomas's parenting had been criticized. This led to the breakdown of Thomas's relationship with his entire family. Thomas became distant from all of them. On April 16th, Arthur goes over to visit his grandma, Joanne Hughes. She notices he has many bruises on his back, one very large bruise on his shoulder. She did not like this and knew that something was going on and he was being hurt. So she made a call to the emergency services team to report bruises on Arthur's back and shoulder. She was able to capture a picture of this wound as evidence as well. On April 17th, just the day after her report, a social worker, Jane Cavanaugh, and a support worker named Angela Scarlett Kopich visited Emma's home to check on Arthur and investigate the bruises that were reported on Arthur. Mind you, this was just a month into COVID, so social distancing was very strong at that point. The visit was scheduled, and so Emma and Thomas were able to prepare for this visit. This day, Arthur was given tons of food. That day, he was playing in the back garden. They made sure Arthur was full of smiles by the time that social worker showed up. The manipulation is uncanny. The social worker stated that when she asked the children, Arthur and Emma's kids, how safe and happy they felt on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being the floor and 10 representing the ceiling. Both boys very confidently jumped up and pointed to the ceiling, saying they felt very happy and very safe. 
She concluded there was no safeguarding concerns and no need to refer this case for full child service assessment. Hughes was instead offered an early help program to assist Arthur in dealing with his traumatic past, which he declined. The scary realization for me is that Emma and Thomas knew how to make Arthur happy. They just chose not to. When the social services worker asked him how he got the bruises, he and one of Emma's other sons claimed it had been caused by a fight with boxing gloves. The social worker left and put on the report no safeguarding concerns, as I mentioned. Giving evidence during the trial, Thomas said Emma had coached the two boys to lie to social services about the fight with boxing gloves and warned the kids that if they say anything, that they would be taken away. So sad. April 20th, a desperate Joanne Hughes, the grandma, who isn't having any luck with social services, tells Arthur's school about the referral to social services she had made four days earlier. Michelle, safeguarding lead at Dickens Health Community Primary School, contacts social services to help Joanne in her efforts, but is told they have no concerns, another dead end for Joanne, the grandmother. The school tries to stay in touch with the kids over the lockdown with online messaging. Thomas tells Arthur's school in these online messages that Arthur is doing grand. Also that Arthur is plodding around enjoying the sunshine and messaging that he's playing in the back garden. He would also say, we might have a barbecue this weekend. He just wants to see his friends now and misses them a bit. Thank you for checking in. In another message, he stated that they were decorating his room. What room? What we will find out later is he was sleeping on the living room floor. So maybe he had a room at one point, but... All the while, Thomas is stating Arthur is doing grand. The same month, Arthur's uncle, Daniel Hughes, tries to alert police to Arthur's bruises. Joanne had called social services in the school with no luck, so the uncle was trying another tactic to save Arthur. The police refer the case to social services, who had already done their investigation and stated there was no concerns. So no further investigation work was done. Social services was the bottleneck of this whole situation. The police and school relied on them to investigate each claim, but they did once and they closed the case. Still not having any luck, John Dalton, Emma's stepfather, says he made an anonymous call to social services. It's not anonymous anymore because the stepfather stated he had made the call. Again, nothing was done and social services once again stated everything that I had already mentioned. It was closed and they did nothing. On June 8th, Arthur's school reopened but Hughes did not send him back. He claimed his son had a bad night's sleep and would send him back the next day. The next day would come and go, and Arthur would never show up to school. Arthur would never return to school. He was so close to returning to school, not sure if this would have made a difference or not, but by this point, Arthur is being beaten and starved. He can barely hold his own body weight up because he is so weak. Thomas couldn't send him back to school in that condition. There were video cameras set up in Emma's house. Therefore, it is seen between June 12th and June 15, Arthur spent more than 35 hours being punished by forcing him to stand in the hallway for hours. Not an hour or so, hours. On Friday, Arthur was made to stand in the hall for 14 hours and 19 minutes with no food. In the meantime, Emma ate McDonald's with her son in the living room. The next day on Saturday, Arthur was made to stand in the hallway for 11 hours and 49 minutes. In the video, the dad is seen slapping him around on the head while Emma grabs him by the back of his shirt and drags him from the kitchen to the hallway to stand there for hours with no food or anything to drink. While he's standing there not allowed to sit or eat, the couple Emma 
and Thomas spent time in their hot tub and was also seen on an extremely hot day eating ice cream as Arthur was forced to stand in the hallway with the fleece onesie. Arthur was in the hallway for 10 hours and 54 minutes on June 15. Emma is seen waking Arthur up at 7.06 by ripping the blanket from underneath him. This is how much she did not like this child. She couldn't be nice to him for one moment. Emma took Arthur with her to a hair appointment and it was just her friend's house that this hair appointment was at. She said Arthur was told to face the door and not move during the six-hour session. The girl who did her hair described the appearance of him as skeletal and his legs were shaking like he couldn't hold himself up. June 16. Video footage from the CCTV camera in the living room at Emma's house where Arthur slept on the floor showed him appearing very weak as he woke up and struggled to carry his blanket out of the room. The family returned to the hairdresser's house to finish her hair appointment during which time Thomas and Emma took turns shouting at Arthur like a game of tennis, she would say. Her partner, Tobias, snuck Arthur a glass of water without Thomas and Emma knowing and said Arthur looked petrified. Back at home shortly after 2.30 p.m., Emma messages Thomas to say, Arthur would not get up off of the floor and claimed he had knocked himself out by hitting his head on the floor. Thomas returned to the home and dialed 999, which is the same as 911 here, and that was made at 242. She left him there without calling for help for 11 minutes. Here's that call. Ambulance service is a patient breathing. Uh, barely. Okay, is he breathing right now, though, even if he's... Is he breathing, Tom? He does. He keeps taking big dark breaths. Basically, my six-year-old stepson is smiling, he's banged his head. Okay. And while he was on the floor, he's banged his head another four times. Okay. He's lost he, colour, he's got a big lump on his head. He's awake. So what's up, Is he awake? He's half in and out, okay. but he's banged his head quite hard. Is he breathing noisy or abnormal? Is it no- noisy or abnormal? He's barely there, he's barely breathing, he's okay. in and out, he's taking well, hard. Okay. He's basically been treating us all like shit. He's threw himself on the floor, he's headbutting the floor. I'm trying to pick him up in the process, he's headbutting yeah. me in the process. Okay. I've got him up, I've, he was breathing like a little bit better at first. Yeah. Washed him down, put some water down on him, tried to obviously get him okay. got a bit more colour in him, but then obviously I've seen the lump on his head that he's done to himself. Right. Help's been arranged for him. Okay. Yeah. Try and keep calm for me. Can you get him yeah. lay out flat on his back? Flat, flat on his back. How yeah, old is he? He's six. Nearly seven. Old. Okay. Yeah. Right, there he's, he's, very, he's very pale, but obviously it's a big bang. He's, he's knocked himself out by okay. the look of him. And he's barely breathing, though. He's, he's breathing. He's barely breathing. He's, he's lost just at the minute. Okay, so I'm going to tell you how to give basic life support. Okay, so we can't just... Body cam footage from the emergency services shows Emma crying as she claimed Arthur repeatedly butt-headed the floor. When I tried to get him off the floor, he headbutted me and hit me and kicked me. She would continue to say, even so, I've done my best with that kid. That kid? Here is that video. Just briefly, what happened? Yes. Basically, he'd gone out to get me a birth to cut a because half the kids, Arthur was told to sit on the thinking step and Arthur's put himself all over the floor, he's banged himself the radiator, he's hit me, he's kicked me in the process of me trying to get him back on the thinking step. He's then gone on all fours on the floor and I've told him to get up and I shut the door over and all I heard was a crack off the floor, he, head, he was head in the floor on all fours, head with the floor once said Arthur get up, you're going to hurt yourself, I've, I've phoned your dad, he went I don't care, at that point he was fine. And then he dropped his head again as I've tried to bear hug him and pick him up and he headbutted the floor three times. Here on his Yeah, carpet. round about, the door was shut, so if you go in, I'll, I'll show you. Okay, it's probably about here his head was, but it's, okay. it's concrete, there's no underlay under that. But he banged his head three or four times. Obviously then went to pick him up. He'd knocked himself unconscious. I'd picked him up, put him on the sofa, poured water in his mouth. So you come in, he's banged his head three yeah, or four times here. I was in the, here. I was in the kitchen, then I'd sat down in the living room and he threw himself on the floor. And you heard him banging I heard his, him head. Bang his head. So what did you do? I came out to him and told him to get up. He told me no. So I tried to bear hug him and put my arms underneath him and pick him up. And he dropped and he banged his head another three times off the floor. 
and as I picked him up, he hit me and he kicked me as I was trying to get him up. And then, and then what? So, he, and you went? I picked him up off the floor. Yeah. Tried to put him on the stairs just to get him to, but his head's obviously going like so. I put him straight on the stairs. Okay. I've got to phone an ambulance. So he's unresponsive? Yeah. <laughs> look, like I say, he's like, the last, the last six months, he's battered both more kids. He's smashed this house to pieces. He's battered his dad. He's hit me. When I tried to get him off the floor from head on the floor, he head him me and he kicked me and he's hit me. Yesterday we went to my friend's house and he pushed me down five stairs. You're not my real mum, I hate ya. <laughs> I'm gonna get my mum to kill you, he said. Okay. And even so, I've, I've still, I've done my best for that kid. He <laughs> I tried to get him off the floor. The dad seems more worried about the consequences and is standing by her side, even though his child was dead by the hands of her. Arthur was taken to the Birmingham Children's Hospital, and later that evening, Emma and Thomas were arrested on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm with intent. Arthur suffered an unsurvivable injury to his head caused by Emma repeatedly banging his head on a hard surface. Emma had shaken him. She had banged his head on hard surfaces, but that wasn't until after she was already poisoning him with salt. He was found with 130 injuries from being repeatedly beaten for hours and starved and dehydrated. On June 17, Arthur's life support was switched off and he died in the hospital. Emma and Thomas are arrested. They go to jail on June 16th. Her birthday is June 18th. Hope you received all you deserve for your birthday, Emma. I believe she did receive what she deserved for her birthday because Emma is not having a good time in prison. She has been routinely attacked by other inmates. The inmates have thrown salt at her, and she is also getting death threats. So therefore, a doctor would say she had a big deterioration in her psychological well-being since she's been in jail. I don't really feel bad. So Emma goes to trial for the evidence they collected in Arthur's death, but Emma's trial was suddenly halted a number of days after she overdosed and was rushed to the hospital. Apparently, she had been taking some pain medication, but she wasn't taking it daily. She was just sticking it into her bra, and then she collected enough and then she took a bunch at one time. She was rushed to the hospital, but the attempt was unsuccessful. I can't even pretend to feel sorry for her. If I had to say anything to her, it would be karma is a... Emma was also pregnant at the time of the arrest with Thomas's baby, but at 21 weeks pregnant and in jail, she decided to end the pregnancy. Nine weeks is how long the murder trial went on. What a long trial. What the trial uncovered is Emma was regularly asking him, please come back, please help, I can't cope, I'm crying, I'm broken, please take him back to his nans, saying it over and over again, what do you want me to do with him, as we talked about, but what you didn't hear was Thomas's reply. He would tell her such things as, end him, finish him, take his jaw off. He could have said, drop him off at his grandma's house, that would work too. She wanted him. I do not understand these parents who want to hold on to these children. The grandparents want them, but they don't want to take them there. It's a whole pride thing. It's so dumb. The video of Arthur begging for food and saying no one loves him, I'll play it, but it's extremely heartbreaking. <laughs> This is how most children's cases I cover feel, but it cuts deeper when you actually see and hear it in action. The pain this boy was brought to life, and Emma and Thomas did not care one 
bit. He is seen barely able to put his blanket away. He doesn't have a bed at Emma's house, apparently. Not sure if he had one at one point, but it was taken away. But he sleeps on the floor at this point and is trying to put his blanket and pillow away. He can hardly stand It's so, so sad. He's starving and emaciated from beatings and standing in the hallway for hours in the heat as a punishment. But that wasn't enough for Emma. Killing him slowly isn't enough. So what she does is she repeatedly doses his food and drinks with a salt solution. She did this for months. And on the very day of his death, he was tested and had high levels of sodium in his system. Arthur had an intake of six and a half tablespoons of salt. After she banged his head against the wall and he's passed out, she took a photograph of unconscious Arthur on her cell phone while he lay dying in the hallway. Then she sent it to Thomas. How disgusting. Even Emma admitted in court that it was horrendous to listen to and watch footage of him captured on her cell phone and the CCTV camera inside of her living room. Now you find it horrendous? Convenient. She is a disgusting human being. Then she lied to emergency services and later police said that Arthur fell and banged his head while on the floor he banged his head five times. They were awful. You don't see a tear, only them painting Arthur in a bad light to save their own butts. What's what's interesting is Emma didn't show up in court to hear the impact statements at her sentencing. It shouldn't be an option. The life of Arthur will never be returned, and it's Emma's fault. She should hear the words of the family. Emma got life in prison with a minimum of 29 years, and the father, Thomas, got 21 years. There are some real concerns that this could have been avoided if child services would have not closed Arthur's case so quickly. We need to talk about Arthur as a child who had visible injuries, who had visible needs, who had said he was suffering, but who wasn't listened to by those who are trained to listen to a child and to intuit what they're not capable of saying. National review into Arthur's death would start immediately, together with an urgent inspection of the agencies involved. The public deserve to know why, in this rare case, things went horrifyingly wrong and what more could be done to prevent abuse such as this happening again in the future. On the last day of his life, Arthur was so frail from his injuries that he struggled to walk. Whether more could have been done to save him will be the subject of an independent review. And what we've got to make sure now is that we learn the lessons about that case. We look at exactly uh, what happened, uh, what else could have been done to protect that child. And it, it is early days, but I can tell you this we will leave absolutely no stone unturned to find out exactly what went wrong in that appalling case. There is a full investigation started, but has not concluded yet. I am curious to hear what comes from that investigation. If they say more training and more staff, I will scream. But what I found out is that the social services are not required to talk to the children alone. They are trained to get the kids alone, but it's not a law that they can take the parents or take the kid away from the parents. So I found that really interesting that they can't talk to the kid alone. This is a very big case in the UK. And part of that, events were honoring Arthur's life. Emma cut up two of Arthur's football shirts. In the U.S., we call it soccer. So therefore, football fans had organized tributes for Arthur, including a banner at his beloved Birmingham City. There was also applause to remember him at the Blues away match with Millwall. Here are a few of those tributes I found. Football fans today clapped for a tragic six-year-old boy killed by his dad and stepmom in a touching six-minute tribute. Applause rang out at packed stadiums across the country as supporters came together to remember Artur Labinjo Hughes. Fans from all sides clapped at the sixth minute of each game, a minute for every year of Arthur's short life, West Ham...
They were his heroes. And Birmingham City warmed up wearing his name. A message for the little boy who thought no one loved him. From footballers to their young fan. And in the sixth minute, crowds across the country clapped. Arthur, are you going to play for England? This video released by Arthur Labinjo Hughes' family is how they want the smiling six-year-old to be remembered. So you're going to play for Liverpool, then Tottenham. What about England? After one of Tottenham. Those dreams were extinguished by those who were meant to want the best for him in life. Arthur's murder rocked the UK in a way I have never seen. Hopefully there is some good that comes from this with reform to their social services. Boris the Prime Minister is backing the law to put child murderers in prison for the rest of their life with no parole, which is called, or will be called, the Arthur's Law. I believe that Arthur would be so proud of his legacy when he's looking down. Well, this was a long one. Please leave a soccer ball next to your comment in support of Arthur, along with any thoughts you have, or if you just want to leave a soccer ball, that's fine too. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and also help decide the cases I cover next, you can do that by clicking the join button. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist if you would like to check them out. Either way, stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye.